Good afternoon, everyone. Um, looking forward to this uh, presentation. So I'll start by looking at the challenges and then offering up some of the solutions. Uh, when you're looking at trying to put, you know, extremely heavy compute uh, software down onto these embedded targets, uh, there's a, quite a number of challenges. But obviously, there's a lot of opportunities here. So if we look at the uh, uh, the large compute demands and then how to get those down onto these embedded targets. You know, some of the opportunities are, of course, with the new architectures coming out, these multi-core SOCs, whether it's NVIDIA, Qualcomm, or other uh, suppliers like that. Um, obviously, uh, techniques such as pruning and quantization, you know, are a big part of uh, running uh, neural networks very efficiently, you know, on edge devices. And then, uh, of course, it's important to have very efficient CNMs. And we are going to announce today our proprietary or patent pending uh, network, I think, uh, with some interesting uh, performance uh, to present. And then if you look at, at the system level, things like thermal management are, are critical. And so what can we do to, you know, to make this part of the problem a little bit easier? And so when we look at how we deploy our, our software down on embedded targets, you know, in the case of at least Qualcomm, we use the DSP core burning our AI workloads. Um, and we have also the ability to very dynamically configure how the various uh, software routines run in combination with each other, including our customers who then integrate their software um, stacks onto the same processor. And how do you manage all those calls and demand for compute resources and such? Um, and obviously that, you know, that goes into building and integrating different software stacks onto these embedded processors. We anticipate that people don't want to have multiple uh, processors, whether they're NVIDIA or Qualcomm or, or whatever. And so what are the tools there to help that? Uh, obviously on the, uh, on the Qualcomm side, you know, we use OpenCL on the NVIDIA side. We use CUDA for development, but we're also relying on, you know, open, open source uh, packages as well. We use PyTorch as our framework for doing all our development. TensorFlow is also quite popular. And then we provide published SDK and manufacturing support to enable embedded software developers to integrate our software libraries and their software stack onto a system, you know, single board compute. Uh, and then in the real world, you know, we have to support long product life cycles. This is not the consumer electronics marketplace. And yet we are now leveraging or tying ourselves to the mobile processor, hence uh, the mobile processor marketplace where you're on this annual cadence. And so how do we, how do, we do that? Well, in, in both cases, NVIDIA and Qualcomm, Qualcomm specifically, they have a, uh, they have a program for, for long life uh, product cycles. So they've got a 10 year uh, product availability guarantee, you know, for the particular SOC that we've uh, that we've selected in, in our system development, and so that's very very important. And if you look at our track record, at least at Teledyne Flare, you know, we're selling a product today called the Tau, which has been in production for 18 years and is now just announced end of life. So, um, you know, we're very familiar and and you know, we recognize the uh, the importance of these supports of these long product life cycles. And then finally, you know, the deployment of this, of these software packages out into the field and, you know, and how do we deal with that and the upgrades and everything else. And so, you know, as a regular part of our workflow, we are constantly upgrading our models. Um, we dockerize our uh, binaries. We're constantly building data sets and we have a fairly uh, regular cadence of, uh, of releases. If you look at our ecosystem, then uh, it's interesting to note that, you know, this deployment down here is just a, you know, a small part of the basic overall product ecosystem that it takes to be in, you know, developing these types of digital products. And if you look at the AI specifically, you know, we've got the ability to create, uh, we have a tool called Conservator. This is our data set management tool. This is where we collect the data. It gets uh, available to annotators. They annotate, upload the annotated data, and then curation, curators can then go in and make the data sets uh, for the application or for the use case specifically. 
Um, then we have our, uh, you know, our standard MLOps where we do the network training and testing and things like that. Uh, one of the things that we have pioneered, though, is also the available uh, the use of synthetic data for model uh, for data set generation and model training. In fact, uh, we had invested in the company, and now within the Teledyne organization, uh, Teledyne Scientific, they have a very sophisticated uh, synthetic data generation tool. That tool was used to train uh, models that were used in the sector a low cost seeker uh, program for DARPA. And, uh, and we've used synthetic data, and I will show you some of the uh, model performance of, of, of that running. Uh, and I believe that this is a very, very important uh, capability. Uh, obviously, field data collection is very, very difficult, to, you know, particularly with foreign military targets and things like that. So our ability to get a problem, solve the problem, and turn a, a trained model around in two weeks is, is what we're hoping to be able to achieve. So we're going to talk about a little bit about our new network called Pile, which is uh, patent pending. And uh, this is sort of just the uh, cadence of, of new, uh, of, of how uh, networks have come to the marketplace. Obviously, AlexNet was, uh, was the breakthrough in terms of uh, winning the ImageNet contest uh, back in 2012. Uh, but today, YOLO is, is a very, very popular network. Um, and we took that uh, single pass approach and, uh, and we, we developed a new network that has a, a, a simpler backbone and some of these other characteristics. I'm not a network engineer, so I, I can't speak authoritatively on that. We have published some papers on that and if anyone's interested, you can reach out to me and we can provide that information to you. But you can see here that it's a very, very efficient network. It's, it's, got, a, it's got fewer parameter, whoops, uh, it's got fewer parameters than, than YOLO X. Um, and if you look at that from a performance point of view, you can see here that it outperforms, you know, all these various YOLO versions, in this case, YOLO X 7 and 8, and then PLA is shown here. And again, the opportunity is to drive as much efficiency on these embedded processors as possible because it gives you so many opportunities to then have that resource available on the on the on the silicon part to do other things. So a good example here is a PLA, uh, not X, but our largest uh, current PLA model is a 768 by 768 input resolution uh, network. It's a big network. Um, on the uh, just going from one generation uh, of Qualcomm, from what is currently referred to as the RB5. Uh, to the next generation, which we call the QCS8550, we're able to run uh, inference, integer eight inference, six times, uh, over five times faster, six milliseconds, to run a very, very efficient, high-performing, accurate, highly precise network. And that means that we can run multiple cameras with low latency, we can do a lot of, it gives us just a lot of flexibility. Plus it, the duty cycle then is so low that the power goes down. The power, not every application is critical, but you know, getting to sub, you know, sub two watts, three watts, that type of thing, and still be able to run this kind of, um, of, of these kind of inference uh, capabilities is, is quite extraordinary. If you look at the backbone issues, then you can see that in these networks, the portion of the backbone in these models is significant. And so we spent a lot of time focusing on that and that's where a lot of our efficiency has come from. And one of the benefits is that uh, it also improves the small object detection capability. Our focus has always been very, very efficient networks designed for small object detection because all of our customers and use cases are for how far can I, how how far away can I make an accurate detection, whether it's counter drone, whether it's ISR, or any of these applications. So we really focus on that. And so the platforms that we support are, there's four platforms that we support, RB5, RB5 Gen 2, which is the Qualcomm, and then we support Xavier and Orin. So all of our libraries are Prism ISP, which is all our 16 to 8-bit image processing software, and all of our AI or 
supported on these four platforms. And then we have all the bits and pieces. So obviously these are all the features within our two, two sets of libraries. And then we have something called Nexus, which is really where we can do things like OnVIF or security cameras and things like that. And Conservator again is this web-based tool for uh, data set development. And just to give you, just as, as, as things are moving from a generation to generation, this cadence that's going on in the mobile processor space is just crazy. Um, you know, in this generation, we've gone from uh, a part that was generally available initially in 21 to the one that's now available. Obviously, you've gone to the smaller node, but you've seen a huge increase in the, uh, in the uh, compute power of this device. And obviously, the cost and the power, everything is going down. Uh, and this will just continue. Obviously with the pressure in the mobile handset space to put large language model, you know, inference on device is, you know, this war that's going on between let's say Qualcomm and, and Apple Silicon is just gonna drive innovation and, and, uh, and performance, you know, for these types of uh, processors. So if you look at the, um, the device, eight CPU cores, and then you have all these other various cores. Uh, the ability to have uh, up to eight cameras interfaced into this, three concurrent cameras. It's just a huge sandbox to, you know, to be able to bring to, into products and, and, uh, and drive down cost and power. It's really, this is all around swap. Here's, and the nice thing is that you've got distributed compute. So depending on, you know, this is what we can provide. And obviously things like SLAM and other things are what customers have to put down on these targets. But between the ability to run everything very efficiently and all these cores, uh, the ability to really build very, very uh, powerful applications or products on these types of platforms is, is very realistic now. We had tried to do that. We have a product called Boson, which is our our uncooled camera, very popular. That uses a Myriad processor, which was a, at that time, very low power, massive parallel processor. And we had anticipated that we would have resources left on that, that customers could put some of their uh, uh, image pipeline on that. Didn't turn out to be the case. We filled it up and there was no way to expand that. Now we've got a more realistic ability to give customers a platform for them to continue to develop their products on top of the, the various libraries that we offer. And again, you can see that how you then configure the system in terms of the signal processing flow, you have a lot of flexibility. Um, obviously, inference is all done on 8-bit, so you can go through an ISP function, all your 16-8-bit processing, and then uh, I'll put that uh, in, you know, through 8-bit into our uh, into our inference engine. Uh, but again, just a lot of just a lot of flexibility there in terms of mixing and matching all the various features and functions that we have, and and us providing the support, the technical support, engineering support to assist customers in doing this. Um, but it, obviously, when it comes to AI, it's all about the data. In fact, most of the things that we have have been very mature for a very long time. Most of our workflow and our and our uh, tool chains and everything else have been, you know, we haven't touched them. What we are focused on are, are the data set. We are now over five and a half million annotation objects in our in our various data sets. So in our data lake, we have five and a half million annotation objects between visible and thermal. Um, and I think this is very, very important. And when you layer on top of that, the ability for us to generate synthetic data, um, it just really is, is a great resource for us to be able to work with customers, um, to be able to uh, create models that perform as, as required. And I'll just run this quick little video. These are gonna be examples of the ISP and the uh, and our models. We have four models. This is our uh, standard Boson 640, super resolved up to 1280 and denoised. And it's, it's a, this monitor is a little large, but uh, it's quite impressive. And the great thing about denoise, if you're going to go through a, a radio downlink, your bitrate goes way down because you can't compress 
noise. So if you reduce the noise, your bit rate goes down dramatically. Turbulence mitigation for ground ISR applications is nice. Electronic stabilization is, we don't have any strong IP there, but it's integrated as a capability in these libraries. This is our local contrast enhancement. Again, some of these algorithms are just too computationally demanding to actually be able to fit into the Myriad processor in products like our boson, so we have to run those externally. So this is the first of our four models. This is our most, you know, we've spent a lot of time on this for, you know, for, in support of our pursuit of uh, automotive ADAS and emergency braking. This is our air-to-ground model. This is probably the model we're spending the most time on currently developing and, and, and focused on uh, getting more data in such five classes in this model. This is our counter UAS, so this is actually perhaps the most deployed model uh, through one of our divisions, FLIR Defense, um, and we had to respond to false alarms about birds and things like that, so we actually trained a detector, a bird detector, and then we just don't display those detections. We improved, we probably improved our false alarm rate by like 90% by training, it, training the model to detect birds. This is some work that we did at a rodeo event a few years ago, and all this was trained on synthetic data. So this is a fine grain classifier, and you can see as we, the taxonomy, we can start with vehicle, military vehicle, and then we can go to the specific, so in this case, T72. And we were able to do that in both visible and thermal. Uh, so at that time, at these events, I think we were the only, uh, only uh, entity that was you know, showing that level of capability. And we've just continued to expand on this. We have a creative with night vision labs with five ISR on, on synthetic data generation and tool development and things like that. So that, that's, that's a big big effort ongoing. Obviously, a lot of places on target there. And again, this will run, you know, in five or six milliseconds. And this is just an example of our super resolution. Again, this is very, very computationally uh, taxing. 100,000 operations per pixel per second. And I'll close just by showing some of the um, impact of uh, super resolution on MTF. So we made some measurements and uh, we found that the MTF is improved by about 75% running our uh, super resolution. And that's, that's my, that's all I have.